Welcome, good afternoon. I'm Michael Kessler, the Managing Director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. And welcome to this Symposium on Religion and Climate Change, which Georgetown is pleased to be collaborating with uh, the United States Department of State uh, for this important discussion leading up to the COP21 talks in Paris. I am going to be very brief in introducing this panel and there is a set of biographies that you may get from the table if you um, are interested in more details about people. The moderator and a participant um, is my colleague, Reverend Drew Christensen, a member of the Society of Jesus, who is a distinguished professor of ethics and global development at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown and a colleague at the Berkeley Center he is a senior fellow um, as part of our um, programs. Joining Father Christensen on the panel is Dr. Mary Evelyn Tucker, a senior lecturer and research scholar at Yale University where she teaches in a joint master's degree program between the School of, Foreign Sur School of Forestry and Environmental Studies and the Divinity School. To her left is Ambassador Akbar, Ahmad, the Ibn Khaldun Chair of Islamic Studies at American University in Washington, D.C., and a non-resident senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a good friend of the Berkeley Center. Next to Father Christensen is Dr. Julia Watts-Belzer, a colleague of ours at the Department of Theology at Georgetown, who focuses on Jewish studies, Talmud, rabbinic literature, and Jewish ethics. And next to Julia is Dr. Willis Jenkins, Associate Professor of Religion and Ethics and Environment at the University of Virginia. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to Georgetown and thank you for your thoughts this afternoon. Drew. Thank you, Michael. Um, as we begin, I want to remind the participants that uh, we're kept to five to seven minutes for our talks. Uh, Michael will signal me, and I'll try to keep tabs. If you go long, no, you'll be detracting from the time I will have at the end to do my part. <laughs> so uh, create a little Catholic guilt in you all. But, <laughs> um, without any further ado, let me ask uh, 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 Mary Evelyn if she will begin and set us, set us on, on our way. Thank you, Drew, and colleagues here. And welcome to all of you friends and new friends. Uh, there's so much to be said and to be added to the very interesting uh, discussion we just had at lunch. Um, I do think we are at a historical moment for transformation, and that's the exciting thing about a conference like this, about the COP coming up as well. I want to um, just also say this is Thomas Berry's 101th birthday, <laughs> um, and he was our teacher uh, along with John Borelli, who's here. Um, and he first recognized many of these issues, as you know, at least 35 and 40 years ago. Um, but also, I want to say that the Bishop's statement on climate change in um, 2001, and even before that, the Bishop's uh, statement on uh, renewing the earth, and even back in 1987, the Philippines Bishop's statement um, were we're destroying our beautiful land, which was very much inspired, that particular one, by Thomas Berry's uh, presence in the Philippines. Um, so I want to suggest that, as was said um, uh, by Sean in the lunch talk, this movement is at least two decades old, and I want to just suggest some of the pieces of it that will help us move forward um, beyond Paris, uh, as we were just invited to do. Um, it was in the mid-90s when um, my husband John Grimm and I convened people at Harvard for the conference series over three years of all the world's religions, including Shinto and including the indigenous traditions, and then published the 10 volumes from that series over another seven years. Um, but it was in 2000 and 2001 that we held one of the first conferences on religion and climate change at the American Academy of Arts and Science in Cambridge and published a volume which is available online uh, from Daedalus, Religion and Ecology, Can the Climate Change? Uh, views of all the world's religions. And then 
um, intersecting, as we tried to do in all the conferences and in our work um, now at Yale, with science and policy uh, and so on. Bill McKibben is in that volume as well. So what I want to suggest is that this point of historic transformation, we do have perspectives from science, from policy, from economics, from technology, from law. Um, but now, this new energy, moral energy, spiritual energy, religious energy, coming from the world's religions, but also from secular humanism, from environmental ethics and philosophy, and a whole range of people, I would suggest, beyond the religious world. And we need to keep that very much in mind, because they are clearly our partners in this. Many people are taking up integral ecology and eco-justice um, who are not overtly religious, but want to be part of this moment of historical transformation. And I think in these discussions, too, we have to um, realize that religions are late in coming to this issue. They are necessary, but not sufficient. They need the science and policy and so on, as, as we've just heard. So some humility um, about what we have to offer, a little more than rhetoric, I think will be most welcome in these kinds of discussions. Um, so that religious leaders, I would say, and communities, um, they're late, but they're critical partners. I would say, as this field and this force is developing, we can say the theologians are few, but they are critical. There's another conference this week of the theologians working on uh, Laudato Si, the papal encyclical. But it's a small band, I have to say. <laughs> it's a small band. Um, the ethicists are largely human-centered, I would say, in all of the world's religions. But they're moving toward including the earth, as we've uh, just heard. And this linkage of ecology and justice is one of the ways forward. Um, the book series from Orbis Press is trying to do that, bring ecology and the human uh, justice issues together. Um, the, the field um, and the force, as we talk about it in churches and synagogues, many of them are preoccupied with their own survival, um, with diminishing numbers, and so on. Seminaries are focused on traditional cur curriculum and see the environment as, as an addendum. And we've been working on the greening of seminaries for 25 years. These are very critical issues of, uh, that we have to attend to in careful and constructive ways. Because if our seminaries are continued to say, this is an addendum, <laughs> that is going to be very problematic. And there's a new survey done out of Israel on all the North American seminaries. Um, it's quite fascinating. There's more progress made, and we need to continue forward. Um, when we talk about this force, so with the field in academia, in colleges and universities, in high schools and seminaries and so on. But this force, I think the laity are definitely pressing for change in all of the world's religions. And we have many examples, of course, of what we call engaged projects. And on our forum on religion and ecology website, we have uh, identified hundreds of these engaged projects in North America but around the world. Some of them were referred to, again, by Sean. Interface Power and Light and Green Faith and, and so on. But I think last September, with the climate march in New York, um, there was a moment when we could mark that out of 400,000 people, almost 10,000 were from the religious communities. And it was stunning when those of us facing south, um, I was with the Yale uh, students and so on, but when the religious leaders uh, joined that group, it was a wonderful moment. And Todd Stern, our climate negotiator from the State Department, when he came to Yale a week later, he said the people at the UN were watching that. And he said, as did Sean, please send us more religious uh, advocates mm -hmm. for this issue. So the opening is tremendous, um, I think. Having Sean and Karen here indicates that. So let me just um, conclude by saying all of this, we're trying to bring theory and practice together theology and ethics together, this field and this force, we need principles, strategies, and tactics. And we really need to make sure our principles are comprehensive enough for the strategies and tactics um, going forward. So I would say we have preparation. And I'm just going to, one minute. <laughs> OK. Um, the preparation to, to summarize really what I'm saying is 
Um, this work that's been 20 years, the Forum on Religion and Ecology, but Fred and many others here have been doing this work, <coughs> Journey of the Universe, of film and book and so on, which appeals beyond the religious communities. We're doing online classes at Yale. But finally, and again, it was highlighted so beautifully, the encyclical, I think, marks this historic transformation and will build on the several decades of work as almost nothing has been able to do. So integral ecology is a way forward, and I think we have a great deal of work to do together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mary Ellen. <laughs> Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Father Drew. It's an honor to be here and to be part of this very distinguished panel. I'm going to make three points. Number one, religion is about balance. Islam wants to balance deen with dunya, the afterlife with this life, the internal with the external. At the core of this vision of society are compassion, knowledge, justice, and the capacity of individuals to live with dignity and honor. My point number one, religion is about balance. Number two. This balance must reflect the relationship with the environment around us, the natural environment and the social environment. Islam is the religion of green. Its color is green. Two examples from early Islam. Read the rules of war from the time of the first caliph, Abu Bakr. A Muslim in the midst of war cannot touch the foliage because nature and the earth belong to God. We are here as temporary visitors. Or look at the Taj Mahal in India. The gardens, the flowing water around the monument, the library in the monument itself. So knowledge, compassion, nature, water, balance. My third point, this balance is upset. I would even dare to say it's broken in spite of the great optimism of conferences like this. And if you want any proof of this, look at what ISIS has been doing in the Middle East, particularly relating to the smashing of the ancient monuments. Mm -hmm. People of faith, the faith leaders, the politicians, some of them struggling heroically, some even unaware of the scale of the battle, are failing or have failed. It is too little, too late. So I appreciate the sense of self-congratulations. It is not enough. We are running out of time. Take a look around you. The refugee crisis, which hasn't even begun yet. I'm not even sure how Europe is going to deal with it. And here, of course, in America, we don't want to look at things across the Atlantic. The ethnic and religious violence that is taking place across the world. The state of nature itself, the typhoons, cyclones, global warming, etc., which we just ignore and say, well, this has always happened. This is just another cycle of, of nature. And then take a look at the vast inequalities of wealth. And once again, we ignore this. Read Lord Jonathan Sachs' The Dignity of Difference, where a few handful of people own as much wealth as half the world's population. It cannot continue like this. And then the poverty. In my latest project on Muslims in Europe called Journey into Europe. I've made a film which is just out and writing the book. We met and interviewed a refugee from the Gambia. And that refugee summed up all these points. A young boy of 16, he traveled across the Sahara for over one year without passports, without papers. He had no such papers with him, no money. He arrived in Sicily, which is where we met him. And of course, from the other side, from Syria, hundreds of thousands of refugees were arriving from the chaos of Syria itself, the massacre and the genocide taking place there. Now, looking at all this, how can we even have an element of smugness when we think we've overcome the problems facing us? I believe it is a time to treat this problem, the problem of man and ecology, with the same sense of crisis that we treat the war on terror. It is a complete war and needs all the marshalling of all our resources. It won't do to meet in these wonderful gatherings where we all think alike and feel that, yes, we must solve it, and we've had a wonderful lunch, wonderful chat, and we go on to the next conference. This has to be dealt with on a war footing. If not, I've just repeated some of the things that face 
not people like you, but people out there in Africa and Asia where millions and millions of people are living virtually on subsistence levels. This young boy, Emadu, arrived in Europe with one thing on his mind, not to blow up parts of Europe, not to take hostages. He just wanted to make some money so he could go back and look after his family. He was the eldest child of this little sub-clan of this particular tribe in the Gambia. African tribes have this great sense of responsibility. He's the elder child. He had great pride. And in that pride, I saw where we were failing him. We were failing him by not showing him any compassion because people looking at refugees think that this is a disease. They do not see a reflection of us in these very people because at some stage, all of us have been refugees. All of us have been immigrants. This country, this great country, is the land of immigrants. So I really urge you to go back to the three or four points I made regarding Islam, compassion, knowledge, justice, and the capacity to live with dignity and honor and ask yourselves, are we able to fulfill these ideals or not? Thank you. Thank you. Now I'll ask Professor uh, Watts Belzer to uh, make our next contribution. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I want to pick up on the many of the themes that you have already begun to raise. I think one of the most pernicious ethical tangles we face in grappling with climate change is the, is the issue of inequality and the injustice of environmental devastation. As we know, politically marginalized peoples and bioregions face the most brutal environmental harms. And this violence is almost always taking place beyond the grasp of or outside the focus of the dominant gaze. So one of my questions as both a scholar of ancient Jewish texts but also as a, as a Jewish feminist ethicist and rabbi is to ask the question, can religion help us sharpen our powers of perception? So to do this work, one of the techniques that I use is to think about how classical Jewish texts might be deployed to sharpen some of these perception problems. I want to give you a little taste of that now. I want to tell you a tale that's uh, set uh, in the, it's a story from the Talmud, a great uh, post-biblical Jewish text that uh, unfolds when the um, under, under Roman, um, Roman dominance in the Roman Empire. As the story unfolds, there's a conflict between Rome and the Jews. The Caesar and his armies are coming to destroy Judea. And a Jewish hero is miraculously almost about to defeat them. Caesar prays to God that uh, the Jews not overcome him. And uh, God answers Caesar's prayers. Kind of problematic from a Jewish perspective. But be that as it may, um, uh, Caesar says it's a miracle. And uh, he refrains from destroying the Jewish community. So the Jews, the story tells us, throw an elaborate, extravagant feast. And uh, the Talmud says they ate and they drank and they lit lamps so abundant that you could see the details of a signet ring for a mile in the great distance. Uh, Caesar sees those, uh, those bright, opulent lights and decides the Jews are mocking him and celebrating at his offense. He comes back, destroys them. And here's the place I want to, to focus on. Rav Ashi, a rabbi, says 300,000 swords, swordsmen ascended this mountain of Tur Malka. There they slaughtered them for three days and three nights, while on the other side of the mountain, the feasters continued to celebrate and make merry, and one side did not know about the other. When I retell this tale, I always think of the words of Arundhati Roy as she describes the ways that violence in so many communities is silenced and unseen. She says, I think of globalization like a light which shines brighter and brighter on a few people and the rest are in darkness, wiped out. They simply can't be seen. So in Rav Ashi's words, one side did not know about the other. When I think of our own complicity in the unfolding devastation of climate change, this is the story that I think of. This is the mountain in our midst. And one of the tasks of religious communities, I believe, is to help show light differently, to help illuminate uh, and make present suffering and violence that seems distant and that seems far away. 
But I also want to suggest that a critical task for religious communities is to think about violence that is happening in our own midst, in our own moment. Um, I have uh, just said a few words about Jewish resources that might make tangible the moral terrain of environmental injustice. I want to uh, take just a moment now to illuminate another place, a nexus between uh, social justice and environmental ethics, uh, the nexus of disability and environmental disaster. Um, natural disaster and other forms of extreme weather are, I would suggest, a vivid, visceral expression of environmental injustice. Uh, talking about Hurricane Katrina, then President George W. Bush famously said, the storm did not discriminate. The storm didn't need to discriminate. We saw discrimination before the storm. Um, disaster almost always intensifies pre-existing social inequalities. So uh, discrimination predates disaster. As we think about how religious communities might be marshaled to think not just about the task of uh, engaging us in thinking about moral concern, but also in concretely mitigating uh, and planning for uh, extreme weather, natural disaster, refugee crisis, I urge us to also think about the place of gender, the place of disability. Uh, structural inequalities um, make, the, um, make the barriers for particular communities all the more vivid. It is our task, I would suggest, as religious voices right, to recognize that there is a moral obligation to assume that no one's bodies, no one's lives are expendable. In a recent important uh, class action lawsuit brought against the city of New York um, in the aftermath of Hurricane Sandy, the lawsuit found that residents with disabilities face disproportionate risks of catastrophic harm or death during disaster. And for religious communities to lift up these dangers, whether around the world on the other side of the globe or in our own cities on the other side of town, this, as I see it, is a critical task I want a world where religious voices remind us it is upon us to do the work of saving one another, all of us. It is upon us to fashion a world, as the psalmist says, where justice and peace shall kiss. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Nicely done. And uh, now Professor Willis Jenkins um, will make the uh, next to last presentation. Right, so uh, thank you to the organizers for this invitation. As you might have guessed, we were asked to reflect on challenges of climate change broadly and how religious communities might respond to them. And so I thought it might be helpful if I try to offer a five minute encapsulation, which might cover a number of the things we've already heard um, and, um, and also might be, I don't know, slightly provocative. So I would describe the, climate, the, the challenge of climate change this way, that there's large scale change in ecological systems at unprecedented speed, which is yet mostly imperceptible to ordinary senses, to the sight and feel of everyday life. And the problem is driven not so much by intentional choices, but by the structure of everyday life, so that the contributing activities to this massive change in systems are mostly unchosen and unthought, in that they are sort of built into the infrastructure of daily life, you know, or lights and stuff. So that means that Bearing responsibility for this big planet-sized change has to touch on everything, because it, it bears on things that, that make possible the structures of our everyday life. That seems hard enough, but on top of that, there is, there's no defining solution that determines exactly what changes are needed. In other words, there's, nothing, there's no course of action that makes the problem completely go away. Humans will, for the foreseeable future, bear responsibility for how atmospheric systems function. 
we can decide there are better and worse ways of learning to bear responsibility for those systems, but we have to decide what are the criteria of better or worse. And we, in the affluent North Atlantic world, are heavily invested in ways of taking responsibility that do the least, po do the least possible, which means to say that we are heavily invested in injustice, which is to say that we are heavily invested and likely to respond to climate change in ways that intensify forms of vulnerability, as we were just beautifully depicted, and that intensify inequalities, as Professor Ahmed just pointed out. Okay, so that's the challenge, and, it's, and it is a gnarly one, an ugly one. What about possibilities? So Francis, Pope Francis in the encyclical um, says that climate change is an opportunity for dialogue. I mean, he presents climate change as an opportunity for dialogue about how to live an authentically human life on Earth and to, at the same time, scrutinize the consequences of power for the poorest and most vulnerable. Religious traditions generally have big and beautiful stories about humanity and Earth big and beautiful and disturbing stories about humanity and Earth cultivated over long periods of time, um, and often in global conversations across many of the boundaries of power and difference that most frustrate the Conference of Parties talks. Many religious conversations work across that. Many religious communities work across that. So there are, in other words, ways of making this inchoate crisis into something that matters for the stories of everyday life that claim people's hearts and give them a sense of meaning and purpose in the world. Um, and I think one of the most remarkable things about the encyclical is that Francis calls for a dialogue about just that. He says here that climate change, yes, is, is a difficult, perverse problem that, is, that is, has every likelihood of leading us into intensifying violence, but yet it can become an opportunity for multiple conversations about how to find the meaning of a human life in these new conditions of climate change. Now, that, that's not all optimistic. I mean, yes, it is true that um, white US evangelical men are statistically the most likely to deny climate change. Well, why? Because there's, well, there's some kind of weird correlation in their investment in fossil fuel culture, and you know, religionists have to be able to criticize that as well. Um, and, you know, should you ask me a question about that, I'd be happy to um, provide that criticism. Um, but let me instead just say, <laughs> let me instead just close by saying, um, I, I th there are, in religious communities, there are, um, as we've heard various ways of saying this already this morning, many ways of, of giving rise to, to transformations of everyday life in the world of climate change that, that extend the possibility of what can be legitimate courses of bearing responsibility and conversely delegitimize um, ways of bearing responsibility that um, on reflection we don't want to be told of us to our grandchildren. Thanks. Thank you, Ross. Yes. Yes. Well, um, Laudato C was really uh, it's kind of a landmark on which a lot of things have been hinging, but it really is part of a much larger conversation that's gone on for decades now. Uh, when I came to the Bishops' Conference uh, 24 years ago, we were just beginning to do that, but other bishops' conferences around the world, as Mary Evelyn, Evelyn suggested, have been doing that, and uh, Pope Francis, in drafting La Data Si, took advantage of that to quote uh, some dozen bishops' conferences around the world uh, on various aspects of, of environmental issues to kind of say, this is a conversation that's going on. It's not, it's not just me, it's the whole church. And this week I've been uh, teaching, the, the church is teaching on, on, uh, on environmental justice to my students and I went back and read the document the bishops did in 1991, Renewing the Earth. And one of the first things we did, we did in that document was to take an inventory of what was already be done in the United States by parishes, by dioceses, by Catholic charities, by the Campaign for Human Development, by Catholic Relief Services. So already 25 years ago, the US Church was very much involved in this issue as it continues to be. All those activities uh, are, are ongoing. 
Um, uh, I think one of the one of the uh, important things about about religion is that it um, it's it uh, is in the business of calling people to conversion. And one of the roles of plays in the environmental crisis is precisely to ask people to look at their attitudes, to look at their actions, and to alter them. Clifford Geertz, in his famous anthropological description of religion, says that, that one of the things that religion provides is long-term moods and motivations that, that penetrate all our experience. And it seems to me that that's providing that kind of basis is the basis on which you appeal uh, in making, uh, bringing people to the, to the point of conversion. Repentance involves uh, acknowledgement, contrition, and a new way of life. And it seems to me this kind of crisis particularly points to the need for new ways of life. Uh, the, uh, um, the, the Catholic social teaching generally uh, has been calling since the time of Paul VI for changes in lifestyle in relationship with the develop, developed and developing world that was accelerated by John Paul II with respect to the need for, for leadership in this area of, of changed lifestyle in order to be able to, to lead the world into to a new uh, environmentally sustainable future. It seems to me, too, that, that um, another point at which lifestyle change is necessary is uh, in the area of political change. Uh, that, that conversion is necessary not just uh, from our personal lives, but from the way we carry out our political lives and the structures of our political life. For 50 years, the church has applied the notion of the, universal, uh, the, the common good to the world community, talking about the universal common good. And now it talks about the planetary common good. It seems to, and part of the teaching of, of, the, of the Catholic Church about uh, uh, the, 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 common, the universal common good is that where there are problems that can't be solved by single nations or even by treaty groups, you have to have some kind of international, transnational authority, transnational regime to deal with those questions. We're going to have to face up to the problem of some international regime changes, not necessarily a single universal state, but regime changes to bring about uh, uh, the changes we need in the environment. Um, and finally, we need uh, changes in um, social life. Uh, the ch the re religion is very much involved in, in the change, not so much at the political level, but at the social level. And here, it seems to me, we have a very important kind of contribution to make. And the church has been doing this all along with respect to environmental justice and the need of bringing the poor and environment together in our work for environmental justice. But what we need to do, especially in lifestyle changes, is to become friends of the poor. And um, Pope Francis has again emphasized, no doubt, to see the importance of human habitat, and particularly the habitat of the poor. And um, to do this, it seems to me that, uh, that we need certain virtues. Uh, and uh, I think as part of doing this, uh, Francis lays out a new set of virtues that's not been given a lot of attention in the Catholic social teaching in the past. He talks about tenderness, gentleness, and care. And I think for the ethicists among us, uh, part of our responsibility in the environmental transformation is to articulate what individually, what personally, what interpersonally, and what socially adapting those virtues of, of tenderness and care will mean for us uh, in changing our ways of carrying on life together. Thank you very much. <laughs> now we're going to have uh, dialogue with all of you. You, you can address your questions uh, to particular people on the panel uh, or to the whole panel. And we we'll, won't we'll ask everyone on the panel to return. Re Reply if you do that, but we'll get one or two who volunteer. So we're taking questions now. Yes, over here. In conceiving the, the panel and the 
There's a, there's a microphone coming to you. Thank you. I'm Jay Kinsar from the Hindu American Foundation. When conceiving the structure of the panel today and the participants, uh, was there ever any consideration in including non-Abrahamic traditions as part of the dialogue, especially Native American or, uh, or pagan traditions who are very close to the environment in their daily worship and uh, how those traditions may uh, provide a uh, perspective on this? I'm afraid I can't answer that. I don't know whether there's anyone from Berkeley who wants to do that or from the State Department. I, I think it can also be said, um, if I'm not being presumptuous, that um, the work that I was representing here, I'm a specialist in Asia. Um, I've done a great deal of work. That My whole motivation for doing the Forum on Religion and Ecology was because China and India are going to change the face of the planet. They already are. And what are the environmental ethics available through Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism. My husband's a specialist in indigenous traditions, and so we had a huge conference on this as well. So it's not to say that uh, uh, I don't want to speak for the panel organizers, but I think we are all deeply concerned about the breadth of these traditions, the eco sick work, and, and so on as well. So thank you for your important intervention. <clears throat> Other questions? Good afternoon. Yes. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. In the back. In the back. Okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Dr. Jalon White Newsom with We Act for Environmental Justice. So, first of all, thank you all for your comments. And I want to particularly appreciate Dr. Uh, Belzer's comments about discrimination before the storm because oftentimes we forget about that mm -hmm. and the fact that the structural inequalities that do exist, uh, we need to amplify that a little bit more. So thank you. But, but getting to my question, I was on a call last week with a couple of funders and some congressional leaders and I was struck that um, how can we better support those leaders that are in place um, when it comes to this issue of choosing between ethics and being reelected. Um, part of my work is to make sure that low-income communities and communities of color have a voice uh, in this federal policymaking process. And I, I guess how, as a religious community, can we uh, be better supportive so, so folks don't feel like they need to uh, uh, not consider some of the justice issues that, that we're facing? Yes. Do we want to take that? The question of political action? Sure. I'll, I'll say that I, I think in, um, thank you so much both for your comments and for your question. I, to me, it seems that in some respects, the seeds of your answer are already embedded in your own biography, the kind of work that's happening within um, the kind of grassroots mobilization within communities to really help make this connection between um, economic injustice, systematic inequality and environmental risk and harm. To me, this seems to be, the more these connections become, become a kind of part of our political landscape and part of the, um, the kind of lived, the, not just the lived realities, but also the kind of expressive realities of folks who are thinking about these uh, connections. That, to me, helps to transform, um, at least in part, some of the political landscapes we're facing. I would also say that um, a lot of the grassroots environmental movements, I want to come back to this gentleman's question about Asia. Um, Sundarlaw Bahaguna, who's one of the great uh, Gandhian environmentalists in, in India, has been you know, against the Terry Dam, but he has done amazing um, work uh, that has had <laughs> traction um, against great odds. The, the work in, in China, um, where the conditions are absolutely unlivable, um, but people who are inspired by their traditions or not, that's why I want to keep this conversation very broad, are doing uh, amazing work. And the government in China has a principle called ecological civilization, um, where they are working um, on sustainability in a very broad level. Um, and the books on Confucianism and Ecology of Taoism and Ecology and so on are translated into Chinese. So this is a, it's a worldwide movement. In, I think sometimes um, that gives us a little bit of hope, <laughs> even though the odds are great, 
Um, but I think this coming together of ecology and justice um, in the long term will, will have a uh, deep effect around the world, despite I, I share the, the cautionary notes. Um, I would add that in, in our experience with the National Religious Partnership on the Environment that religious communities are natural places to have dialogue on these issues. People make connections between what they're suffering immediately and the environment within a very short time. You know, you can bring them in on, on, the, on the, uh, the problems of gentrification, mm -hmm. and before you know it, they're talking about environment. Uh, and religious communities, certainly some like ours that cut cross classes and cross groups, are able to, to, to help address questions precisely because they convene people from different parts of the society on different sides of the issue, and they have to engage one another face to face. And so I think, uh, in addition to organizing, I think uh, convening is a very important function that the, uh, the con religious congregations pr can provide. Thank you. Uh, Fred Brueger, National Religious Coalition on Creation Care. I'd like to take three themes from the, the talk during lunch, two from Sean Casey. He emphasized that religion looks for the long-term perspective. At the same time, he engaged the problem of multinational corporations, particularly the fossil fuel companies, with their uh, fiduciary responsibility to turn a profit, and so they have a different genre of values than real people. And uh, then uh, Karen, who's talking about uh, the need for ambition and urgency. How then, knowing that we have the, the need for urgency, that we need a long-term plan. Uh, how do we address, as people of faith, corporations who feel they have their own internal set of values that are financial values, they're not human values, how do we address this barrier to mobilizing the nation? Good question, Fred. Anyone want to take well, that? I just testified at Yale about the divestment issue on Thursday morning, and it wasn't easy, I can tell you. But I do think that this notion that what's just happened with the Exxon uh, misinformation, disinformation. Yes. And I said to Yale, if you have a mission statement that says you are for to create uh, and to disseminate knowledge, to create, preserve, and disseminate knowledge, you are against the mission statement of, of Yale, you see. Now, <laughs> the corporation, the trustees, have got to take this into consideration um, because I think, Fred, you know, you've been on the front lines of this issue, but I think we have an unprecedented opportunity with the subpoena from the, um, the Attorney General of New York State with a congressional calling for investigation. And this is across the board of the fossil fuel industry. So I think we have an opening as never before that, uh, I mean, Georgetown is divested, as I understand it. And um, so I think this moral force, UCC divested, the Episcopal Church divested, um, there's ways in which we can open the doors, but it's a huge challenge. I thank you for your question. And Fred, uh, with the corporations, you also have the politicians who very much depend on their constituency and how they're thinking, and they will not go against the popular trend. So you have faith-based leaders who are thinking of the future, the next generation, and so on, and you have the people who are living in the real world, as it were. My point is that the people in the real world are far too powerful and far too strong to allow faith-based leaders into the arena. And therefore, you recall Stalin's statement about the Pope. How many divisions does he have? That's the reality. Who influences the media? Even the debate, you see global warming all around you. Your eyes are telling you it's happening. And yet you constantly hear that, well, there's a doubt. These scientists have been bought. Some of them are corrupt. You know, constantly you get this polluting of the waters. The faith-based leaders have to be much more vocal, much more aggressive. This is a fight for humanity, fight for civilization. It's existentialist. There won't be much left of this century. By the end of the century, we are fighting for these little turf wars. You see all the religious conflicts, and you see the ethnic conflicts. There won't be much left. So therefore, understanding the urgency, the volume has to increase if you have to change the thinking of the corporations and the politicians, they're not going to change by themselves. I think the dialogue has to be very strong with, with business schools. Mm -hmm. I think business schools have pervaded the notion that 
the quarterly return is the measure of everything and that your fiduciary responsibility ends with the quarterly return. It seems to me that we have to engage the people who teach that kind of thing to understand the actual sociology of trust and the way it works in business. Uh, Benedict did a great job in Caritas and Veritate explaining that, but it's, it's, it's a long tradition in sociology and in business sociology. The trust is much broader than that kind of narrow legalistic understanding of fiduciary trust. And uh, universities have a special role in educating. Um, I was surprised when Georgetown divested from coal that it didn't divest from carbon in general. Mm -hmm. And I was told that the reason it didn't was that the coal companies weren't doing anything. But some of the oil companies, at least, were investing in renewables and, and, in, and, and uh, doing research about what they could do, and so that they hoped to dialogue. Now, what has to be done when that kind of decision is made is to follow through on that kind of dialogue. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, and you know, the point of divestment is it gives the intention, the attention to things. But it seems to me, yes, but you have to do very careful analysis and then target and have dialogues on, be, on behalf of the, the trustees of the university. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. Way in the back there. <coughs> Paul Terry, I became very interested in the environment through Father Thomas Berry, who was at Fordham University decades ago. I've lived in Washington for over 40 years, and I've learned a lot about politics since coming here. I have friends who worked in the White House on the Hill, and all they talk about is raising money. <laughs> and they take money from all of these various uh, companies, big money companies, and this influences the, the way they vote and their legislation. Yeah. And I feel like until we get rid of such legislation as Citizens United, the McCutcheon Bill, and return to a real democracy where we all have votes and uh, our voices are heard, that this is going to continue to be an uphill uh, battle. Just for example, uh, the two Democratic senators in Virginia that I have a great deal of respect for are supporting fracking. And fracking is, is poisoning our groundwater. And uh, there's only a few states that have banned it to this point. So again, I think that um, we all need to be uh, vigilant in working with our politicians and helping to educate them. I don't know what else we can do, but um, we need a movement in that direction, too. Thank you. Thank you. Up in the front, Catherine Marshall. I'm Catherine Marshall at Georgetown at Berkeley Center. Mary Evelyn, uh, you've been, I know, uh, at two recent meetings that have had many religious voices, the Parliament of Religions, and I think you were at the Bristol uh, meeting that ARC organized. Um, no, just a but I'm curious if there were any surprises or, mm -hmm. I, I know the parliament was pretty clear in the direction of the, of the thinking, very strong emphasis on the indigenous mm -hmm. voices, but were there any surprises in 9,500 or whatever uh, people from different religious traditions? Well, that's a great question, Catherine. I appreciate it. So the Parliament of World Religions took place a few weeks ago in Salt Lake City. It's uh, about 10,000 people who come from all over the world. I've been going to them since 1993, which was the second one after the 1893 one. And we've been working every five years as they've been held in different parts of the world, Barcelona and South Africa and, and Melbourne and so on to infuse the parliament, which was largely about dialogue and tolerance, which is absolutely critical. But if interreligious dialogue isn't focused on these pressing issues, everything is almost secondary. So I, to answer your question, I was thrilled to see this really moved up to uh, across the board in a much more significant way, namely environmental issues, justice issues, climate change, and so on. And I would also say the American Academy of Religion, 10,000 scholars of religion, last year at their meeting in San Diego, it was the major theme. Jimmy Carter came and, and spoke on it you know, as well. So I think um, we're making progress. We need to go further. And the parliament did a good job in this respect. The gentleman up here in the front. We have a mic up here. Yep, 
Hi, I'm, I'm Dr. Rajman Singh, president of EcoSeq. Um, I was at, at Bristol um, and also in Paris uh, for the preparation for the religions and uh, um, nations coming for a dialogue. I, w I have a question. Um, as we try to see how we can engage uh, uh, people at the grassroots level uh, to really make this a part of their everyday observances, the consciousness about the environment, so, and we, we started a, a movement called March 14th as a Sikh Environment Day, where we asked each um, adherent of the Sikh faith to take action. So I'm just posing a question that we religious leaders, we go to conferences, we issue statements, we you know, pass <laughs> resolutions, but does that really percolate to the level, at the grassroots level, where people come to churches, synagogues, and mosques, or gurdwaras, um, they are praying for heaven or whatever, the everyday problem. Is the environment becoming a, a, as we are saying, it's such an urgent issue, but is that being translated into a, a some sort of a prayer, as some sort of an observance, or some sort of a, a daily messaging coming from religious places? So people are yeah. going home, not just saying that this is only religious leaders are going to decide something up there. Mm -hmm. Or is it really people are engaging and seeing the urgency as the leaders are expressing? Well, so Julia, why don't you want to take that? You want to start? Okay. Uh, well, you probably know better than any of us I, academics. Yeah, exactly. um, but I think let me do, let me say I think that there are uh, um, a couple two different orders of response. I mean, there are there are climate change focused responses from religious communities, and then there are climate um, affected responses, which are just the practices of that, that community, um, now self-consciously undertaken in conditions of climate change. As an example, um, one might offer specific prayers or lamentations directly around climate change, or one might offer um, prayers or gratitude or blessings for food now self-consciously undertaken in recognition that our global agriculture has this, this, this broad effect. And um, so I just think that they're, they're, they're separate things, and, and the latter is obviously harder to track. But I think it's, it may be critical for addressing some of these big picture worries about what it means to, to try and address environment issues in conditions of plutocracy. Um, well, insofar as we have um, communities that are focused on realizing some particular form of true wealth through their practice of everyday life. And that pursuit of real wealth is undertaken in the knowledge that we live in a, in, um, a human-driven environment. Um, I, I think that it begins to exert kind of undermining effect on plutocracy, right? So that's the, the, the second one is harder to track, harder to describe, harder to say, because it doesn't produce those, the statements and the, the votes and so on. But I, I think, and I, then, the, then the live question is, well, how are they connected? Julia? So. Uh, within Jewish contexts, there are, I think, a number of places where this is happening, a number of uh, groups and uh, organizations working to make connections between Jewish ritual practices, Jewish food and eating practices. I'm thinking of uh, Shalom Center's work around environmental activism, including uh, Yom Kippur, a major Jewish holiday, recently sort of public observance focused um, here, at the, um, here in D.C., around uh, environmental devastation, climate change, Chazon, the Jewish food movement, uh, aiming to really, on a very uh, both structural level, but also on a sort of micro level of the individual choices people are making about Jewish eating, uh, raise some of these questions. My own interest is particularly in questions of water, uh, rain, and drought. Uh, so many Jewish texts are deeply connected to the very agrarian texts and deeply connected to concern about uh, drought, which, as we know, is such a pressing issue for us in this moment. Uh, so interested in thinking about how Jewish communities can activate some of the daily, some of the prayers and, uh, and ritual insertions in the, in the daily liturgy to make a connection between a sort of ancient paradigm of praying for rain and our own contemporary environmental uh, situation. I, I would say on our website, as you know, uh, Dr. Singh, there's hundreds of projects that are engaged projects in addition to the statements. And now our 
our task is, I mean, the explosion of statements since the papal encyclical from various groups, Buddhist groups, Jewish groups, uh, Muslim groups, and so on, is, is also very encouraging. But I really, again, following <laughs> our friend here, I think we need to press forward. And I would say the challenge for the Jesuit universities, which, um, you know, they, they need to indigenize this as well, because uh, we have an unprecedented opportunity, I think. So thank you for your question. Steve, would you want to comment on the, what the Bishop's Conference is doing? Steve Kalecki, <clears throat> from the Office of International Justice and Peace at the Bishop's Conference. Sure. Uh, uh, well, you know, uh, Laudato Si has given us an unprecedented opportunity. So. Uh, I would divide up our, our work into maybe uh, several layers. And the East, One, environment. Excuse me? Environment. In the environment. Yeah, on the environment. I'm sorry, sorry. All right, but, but Laudato Si is kind of where we've yeah, been right. pegging okay. a lot of it. So, you know, we've, uh, what we've been doing is we, we've, uh, uh, we have an environmental justice program within the conference which uh, has been working on uh, everything from, uh, you know, uh, legislation to protect children from poisons and toxins in the environment to broader uh, work. Right now, our, our major work is focused actually on the Green Climate Fund and also on uh, the national carbon standards. That the bishops uh, uh, officially supported that, and we related that work. Uh, th that's sort of systemic. But then there's also the work that individual dioceses are undertaking with some encouragement from the conference, like the Archdiocese of Chicago, which has done a, uh, did a joint program with the EPA to uh, green up their buildings and so forth. We heard in an earlier presentation how our, our buildings are sort of a disaster. I'm not quite sure exactly. Uh, did you have a particular aspect of well, our program? I, I was thinking of, of what was being done in terms of, of daily life in the, within the parishes. Oh, well, uh, within the, the parishes, we, we, we have an educate. Thank you. Now I get it. OK. Uh, <laughs> What, what, Sorry what, we've, what we've been doing to sort of particularize it is, you know, first of all, things that are important to Catholics we pray about. And so we have produced a whole range of resources to integrate prayer uh, on the environment into our, our rituals, into our regular preaching. We provide homily helps, and we have a whole uh, uh, section of our website that provides materials like that. And we work very closely with the Catholic Climate Covenant which is a wider umbrella that includes the bishops' conferences, but also religious communities of men and women and other Catholic groups like Catholic Relief Services and Catholic Charities USA that are producing homily helps and uh, uh, prayer resources. Beyond prayer resources, then, we've been lifting up particular uh, projects that people can do to do the greening of their own neighborhoods, but also uh, to partner with, for example, Catholic Relief Services and their overseas work on resilience uh, helping uh, uh, communities to be more resilient to climate disasters, but also uh, to uh, mitigate and adopt new technologies to leapfrog over the carbon-intensive sort of development that we that we experience. So we have that. So there's prayer, there's action. You know, give generously to CRS or give. Uh, you know, but then th there's also the advocacy piece, which was the piece I started with, which is we've been uh, giving our people in the pew uh, handles for supporting things like the Green Climate Fund which will 50% of the fund, international fund, would help uh, developing nations to mitigate, and the other 50% would help them adapt uh, to climate change events. And that's both a solidarity with the planet, but also a solidarity with the poor. And then, uh, and then the uh, national carbon standards. We've been really having our people uh, uh, resist efforts in Congress to block the administration's ability to institute a national carbon standard for, um, uh, for power plants, which is uh, you know, part of what we hope our nation's you know, putting on the table, of course, uh, in Paris. Did, does that give you a fuller? Yeah, sure. Yeah, thank you, Steve. Did you get what you needed? Uh, uh, Ambassador Ahmed. Um, thank you, Dr. Very quick statement. Um, I noticed there's a tendency for us to look at these issues in an ethnocentric way or through an ethnocentric prism. So this is the Catholic version, and mm -hmm. we luckily have a pope who's enlightened, and <laughs> I'm a great fan. But tomorrow we may have a different kind of pope. We have a Jewish perspective, a Muslim perspective. We've just heard about the non-Abrahamic perspective. This is a global problem. It affects every human being on this planet. We have to stop looking at it through this very narrow prism. It has to be tackled globally. Global problem, tackled globally. Otherwise, we will remain in silos and compartments, and we will not be able to overcome it. The challenges are great enough without us looking at it in this ethnocentric manner. 
there is the tendency, I just want to remind ourselves we have to be careful about not allowing that tendency to block our vision. Thank you, Mr. Besso. Thank you, everyone. Oh, that was a good final comment. Michael? Michael has some announcements to make. Oh, it's 10 more minutes. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> the audience is more queued in than I am. I apologize. Oh, class is out now. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, they are? Tobias? University. Um, on that last point, just real quickly, Laudato Si, the encyclical, is the very first encyclical that was written specifically to every human being on the planet. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah. That's why I'm such a fan of his. <laughs> <laughs> he thinks globally. Up here in the front? Thank you. Bob Faithful from uh, St. John's Episcopal Church. I'm a Green Faith Fellow and also a participant in the Faith Alliance on Climate Solutions. This goes to uh, Professor Willis. And also, I want to thank you, Professor Belzer, for your comments. So uh, uh, part of my journey started with one of the faculty members here at Georgetown doing a presentation on extreme heat. I can't remember her name. She's one of the co-producers for Years of Living Dangerously. But she focused upon how uh, we sometimes missed, or it was invisible, how many people died each year who were young or were, who were old in our neighborhoods or who were, uh, when a death certificate was issued, was not, uh, you know, was not identified as heat being one of the issues. What I wanted to toss at you was, as a person of the laity, when you talk about big issues like, you know, uh, global contribution, so forth and line, it misses what is important to those of us that are looking to figure out how we can help our neighbor. And this is worldwide. What can we do in terms of uh, activities that can be of assistance to our neighbors? For example, in our county in Fairfax, which is one of the big counties near here, we have a wonderful program with our churches to help people in the wintertime when there's cold or snow. But we have almost nothing happening in terms of the extreme heat. What can you do as far as being academics, to be truth tellers, to bring the truth down to those items that are doable by the individual churches, doable by communities that say, how can we help our neighbors, and doable in terms of you know, bringing about a realization that it is something that touches us, we just may not be seeing it. Well, I think you have just told us, and I, <laughs> and I th thank you for it. Uh, this part of this, it, it's part of the gnarliness of the problem of climate change that at the planetary level at which it plays out, it is overwhelming and there's no particular way to, it's difficult to find those, those connections. The death certificates don't say climate change on them, right? Um, so there's that, and, and yet um, there are these, these constructive positive ways of connecting through local communities and making, and making the connections. Um, and yes, I, th I just think, yes, thank you for that. And, and I think part of, the, part of the, the difficulty, but also maybe the promise that religious communities have is having ways of enacting solidarity with neighbors in new forms that are responsive to planetary ecological perils, which and that, what that can do is help ordinary people uh, with this sense of being overwhelmed by some abstract thing. I'd like to add to that, if I may, because I, I think that this piece is in this piece about solidarity, about neighborliness, about being present for people. It's 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 so it's critical, um, but it's also critical to remember that the people who most need help will have difficulty getting it. Right? They'll have difficulty evacuating from their apartment buildings. Right? Yeah. They will have difficulty speaking the local languages. They will have difficulty, you know, they'll have a bunch of kids in tow. And we'll, so I think this, as we, as we think about how uh, religious communities and other community spaces can provide support and refuge for people, it also means grappling with the fact that the people who most need assistance are not going to be able to show up neatly at your door. Right? So this is where that kind of community planning for um, 
So in New York City now, they're making high-rise evacuation plants, right, as a direct result of the, of the, of the lawsuit I, I mentioned, right? Because when it comes time to evacuate, a lot of people won't be able to walk down their 20 flights of stairs, right? So that kind of planning, I think, is also a critical way in which religious communities, too, might hold at the forefront this, this value, this aspiration of making sure that uh, the way we imagine help in the community being available for people right, actually reflects the needs of our, uh, of our complex and often very global communities. Let's say you have natural bases in a lot of communities uh, for uh, religious action in this area. I mean, uh, in Arlington you have, uh, I think, 4,000 units of affordable housing provided by, by a local group that's religiously motivated that started out with providing 15 uh, apartments, and now they have 4,000. Uh, or, or accommodations for 4,000. And uh, you also have fair housing coalitions that, in which the churches participate. I think those are the natural places to address this issue because that's already where people are involved in the question of, of human habitat. Mm -hmm. uh, person back here, right, the woman right behind you. Hi, I'm Grace Patterson. My work is with an interfaith uh, international development organization called World Faith. I have two questions, and I'll try to be very brief with both of them. The first is for Dr. Watts-Belser. I found very resonant what you had to say about our responsibility to make imminent the suffering of others on the other side of the world, on the other side of town, for folks who don't often feel that imminence, right? Particularly, we heard the flip side this morning of people mobilizing around feeling drought in their own community mm -hmm. or feeling rising costs of energy in their own community. So I'd love for you to be able to speak a little bit more about practical strategies, tools, resources for us to live up to that responsibility. Um, my second question is for Dr. Jenkins. I think I heard you say that we have a tendency to invest heavily in some of the least impactful solutions to this problem. Um, and so I'd love for you, if I heard correctly, to say more about what those are and where our focus might better be placed. And if I didn't, I'm, I'm sorry to have misunderstood. You got it. Great. So practical strategies for living up to that responsibility. I mean, wow, that's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, I think that one thing I would say, again, speaking particularly about what religious and theological communities might offer to this conversation, uh, the more robustly we can help our communities grapple with emotional, psychological, religious resources for um, grief, shame, guilt, like all of those, all of those anxieties, I, I think those are so often motivating the look away response, mm -hmm. um, the, des the desire to not look closely um, in, in my own experience and in, uh, it comes in large part from the fear of what it will do to us if we do. So the more that our religious communities and what other, you know, sort of our, our ethical resources more broadly can allow us to become aware of the need to live with that discomfort and then to work on, on um, challenging the root causes of it. Right? But if we, if we aren't able to be present to that discomfort, it short circuits the very ability to, be, to, to even perceive. So um, the, one of the, the corrupting perils of an intergenerational problem that affects the infrastructure of our lives on which we are dependent and invested is that we have a high incentive to do something, but not that much, and to pass off the problem as much as possible to future generations under the cover of having done something. Mm -hmm. And because of how pathetic our US national discussion has been so far, this morning we were focused on getting momentum. And I don't want to take away from that. Like, clearly, we need more momentum, no doubt. Um, <laughs> but we can sometimes, you know, people I, like us, I guess, in this room, care about climate change, so focused on doing something, just pushing to the, the dial that um, 
we, we, can, we can draw back from critical awareness of how much incentive we have either to take action that gives us the cover of having done something or to take action that intensifies structural vulnerabilities around the world. Lots of different ways that can happen, right? But um, there's this great, so, I mean, we were just all about the encyclical today, but there's a great line in which the Pope says, R um, rather than a problem to be solved, the world is a mystery to be received in gratitude. Um, and I think that means, look, Climate change, we could take it as a problem to be fixed, and you can bet the North Atlantic world has some really great ways of fixing it. They'll involve climate engineering and carbon markets, right? Um, and what will those things do? Well, they will reinscribe the advantages of the North Atlantic world into the climate. And that's a, that's a real peril. And I don't want, and you know, this is slightly tactical. What do you focus on, right? Like, yeah, you gotta get momentum at Paris first. Yes, <laughs> and, then, and then at the same time, bring this critical insight into what are those policies doing in relation to these big structural um, problems. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's time now for Michael. <laughs> all right, well, thank you to all of the panelists uh, this afternoon. What you're <laughs> We will have about a 45 minute to 50 minute, not a break. There is coffee, tea, cookies in the room immediately adjacent to this room. It is a share a opportunity for a number of groups that are represented here today um, to discuss with you about what they are doing at the grassroots level, at the policy level in climate change. It's a networking opportunity, so please mingle and get to know each other and what you're doing. Uh, in these in these spaces, we will reconvene for another great panel. Um, we have Ruth Messenger from uh, Adam Taylor from the World Bank, um, Marianne Cusimano Love, a colleague from across uh, the city at Catholic University, Catherine Marshall, who will moderate um, and lead, um, and it it will be a, a great opportunity. So um, we will reconvene that about just after 3 p.m. Thank you. Cool. Thank you.